This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome. So, um, welcome back. Uh, my name is Larry Rand, and uh, I'm uh, really thrilled to be here today uh, to share uh, some thoughts and an incredible panel of leaders um, in regards to preterm birth and prematurity. And I realize all we think about all day is prematurity, not all day, but um, we know that that's not necessarily what's at the top of everyone's mind. And um, But for the next hour, we really want to get you excited about it. And we also understand we are the only thing standing between you and lunch. <laughs> so we're going to really try to make it worth your while. Um, but hope that you will engage with us as well and share your reactions and thoughts and, you know, anything that may be uh, sure. bothering you or, you know, that you've been thinking about. And if maternal child health even touches uh, the framework of uh, what you do, um, we would love to hear about it. So. Uh, Really, the most, the most important message I, I want to begin with is that um, prematurity or preterm birth, which may not be at the top of everyone's list when you think of um, pressing health problems, is actually um, a global epidemic. And um, it's, it's actually one of the most intractable problems we've, we're facing in maternal child health. It, the numbers are staggering, and when you actually, you know, I, I try to use as little on slides as I can, but I feel like the numbers are important to look at. We have worldwide 15 million uh, preterm births a year, and 1 million kids who die as a result of prematurity. And in fact, it is now officially the leading cause of uh, not only neonatal mortality, but childhood death under five years old. So that is the leading cause worldwide, and very, very troublesome. It's troublesome because we have not just these one million deaths, but those who survive are at high risk for lifelong disability. And you can only begin to imagine the cost implications that has on a family, on that individual, a family, a society, a community, and the numbers are actually inestimable to some degree. In the U.S., we have a number that's often talked about, $26 billion a year are spent um, on costs secondary to prematurity, and that's an outdated number. Um, and it really um, it speaks to the fact that these numbers are, um, at best, an estimate. The data are woefully inadequate. Right now, our worldwide data, which is the best we've got, reflect only facility deliveries, so don't take into account deliveries that happen at home, and you know that that has been an issue worldwide. They don't take into account um, a preterm birth that's born stillborn, stillborn, and so it's only live births, and that actually uh, takes out another big chunk. So our data are really problematic. I can't even begin to explain to you um, without getting into too much detail, but we're talking about weeks of pregnancy, so gestational age is an assumption we make when we classify these data. But around the world, most women don't know their gestational age or how pregnant they are. They know they're pregnant, but not when their last menstrual period was and they haven't had an ultrasound. So maybe that gives you a glimpse into how problematic the data has been and how hard to collect. And, um, you know, it's, it's not a new epidemic. This has been an epidemic for a long time, but it's actually been ignored for quite a while, and it's been ignored because it's so complicated. It's, it's one of these perfect examples of an epidemic that um, the, the biological and social determinants that drive it are so closely interwoven that they seem intractable. And so it's either accepted or ignored, and certainly something that donors are scared off by. It doesn't feel or seem like we can achieve results. And there are many groups out there working on this, who've been working on this, and have faced incredible frustration not moving the needle nearly enough as much as we'd like. So I will say that this, without a doubt, is a multifactorial condition. When you think about a pregnancy and what it takes for a pregnancy to go wrong, most pregnancies go well, despite some people's best efforts for them not to go well, they go well. And 
when you think about what it takes to reject a pregnancy for a woman's body to simply not allow that pregnancy to continue without any warning, there are a lot of things that play into that happening. And it's, it's complicated, and there's not going to be a silver bullet, not one thing that's going to solve preterm birth. It requires that there be a multifactorial approach, and it takes into account the biological and the social drivers. So with that in mind, we have, um, uh, we're here to talk about what was just mentioned a few minutes ago, that the problem of collaboration. This is not a problem that any one organization or institution should even presume they can solve in isolation and is really a great example of what it takes to work collaboratively, but to do it effectively and to have a collective impact. That's, what's, that's what it's going to take without a doubt, and it unfortunately has not been working well to date. So we need some sort of platform with which to try to do things differently. And um, I'm excited to be able to, to talk to you uh, during a very exciting time here. UCSF is proud to partner with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Mark and Lynn Benioff on a new preterm birth initiative, which we're um, very creatively dubbing PTBI, <laughs> Preterm Birth Initiative. And, uh, and I'm re actually really glad it's got the name initiative because it's all about trying to get the right people to the table and develop partnerships. And that really is, um, I'd say, what you know, we're here to talk about today. We want to think about the lessons we've learned in the work that's been done to date. We want to think about how we can really do transdisciplinary work, what that means, how to work collaboratively and in a way that people still get credit or, or achieve the drivers that usually uh, play into collaboration not going well. And importantly, to actually include the voices of the women we are trying to affect, to not be in this room talking about what we think is best uh, without actually engaging the community. So this is a global initiative because it's a global health epidemic. And that includes the U.S. because the U.S. is on the globe. And the U.S. has some of the worst preterm births you can imagine, number six on the list of all the countries. And um, it really gives us a chance to look at overall rates and also the health inequities and disparities that are seen all over the world when it comes to birth outcomes. Um, it is also a local initiative in the sense that we are zeroing in at the community level, engaging with the community, partnering with the community, mm -hmm. and creating an ownership of the work that we'd like to do, because ownership will build demand, and demand will result in sustainability. And we, are, we have to make sure that any investment that's made as part of this initiative is sustainable, or it will run out when the dollar runs out, and that is not what we're trying to do. So with, with that in mind, we are currently in a planning phase for this initiative, and that gives us, that really sets the stage to landscape what the issues are, who the, uh, the folks that have been working hard and have devoted careers and frustration and blood and sweat and tears to trying to solve this issue and to uh, learn from their wisdom. And so um, I'd like to introduce to you our esteemed panel uh, today to talk a little bit about what's on their mind at the moment when we think about preterm birth as we all step into working together and thinking about who else to bring into the picture and uh, where the work needs to be done so that we can effectively collaborate uh, in this initiative. Uh, we want to think about how we can collaborate, what the lessons learned were, what are the priorities that we need to focus on, and what's realistic. We can't do everything. We don't want to dilute the work. And, uh, and unfortunately, this is a condition where we don't even know the basic mechanism of what drives it. We are missing some of the most basic information, yet we have existing solutions that could save lives right now, and we can't seem to implement them well. So there is a lot of work to be done, despite all the work that's going on. So let me take that segue to introduce um, uh, our leaders here who might help us to think about how to do things differently. Um, we will, I'll introduce them one by one, if that's okay, um, starting with uh, Marion Clayson, who is uh, currently the director for uh, Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I will keep it at that for each because I could probably speak for five minutes about everyone's incredible life story. Um, and please engage with our, our leaders if you want to hear a little bit more about that. 
So, Marion? Thank you so much, Larry, for that introduction, and thank you, Jaime. Thank you both for, for inviting me and to invite me to this panel, because clearly, looking around the room here, I see many of the world's experts on preterm babies and prematurity. Experts both in the discovery world, in the delivery world, in the advocacy world, and the sciences that bring all these three elements together. And I must say, the reason why we and the Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are so excited about partnering with the team here at UCSF is the ability to bring these three streams of work together. The, the upstream discovery world, the delivery sciences, and the advocacy. Because that's what actually you can bring here to this global effort. Um, it's not just the fact that UCSF brings the, the basic sciences, but it is about the fact that, that in this area there is a, now a bit of a tradition of actually looking at collective impact that uh, Larry talked about, Get, being local and bringing, sort of break down this dichotomy between what's local and what's global. Mm -hmm. Let me give an example for that, of that. I don't know if you who live in the San Francisco area actually know that the public health department here in San Francisco has records of preterm births, women by age, income, zip code. So we know there are some zip codes here in the San Francisco area that has the same preterm um, pre percentage of preterm births as you will find in Mali, Burkina Faso, Uganda. So what Larry said too is that this is of course something that unites us. The risk of a teenage girl, an adolescent girl, to actually have a pregnancy that results in a preterm baby is, is a universal challenge. The likelihood of that preterm birth resulting in death, though, is disproportionate among low-income areas and poor households. So we are so looking forward at trying to really bend the curve on newborn. And why do we need to bend the curve on newborn mortality? It's really a disgrace that today it is, as Larry said, the number one cause of under five mortality. It's not just the large share of newborn mortality. So if we want to see beyond 2015 and reach those ambitious goals that some of us are hoping for, by 2030, we have to take that period of life serious. As we make pro have made progress in child mortality, the deaths are concentrated around birth. The maternal deaths, newborn deaths. It's sort of peaking around the birthing opportunity. And all of you who have talked earlier about quality today, that's the sad thing. The quality of care at the moment of birth is in many places, of course, a driving cause why those who come with a preterm birth die. So what's exciting here? First of all, as Larry said, we have a solution gap. If we look at uh, what we know about preterm births, the preterm birth prevalence, actually we only have about 20% of solutions to address the likelihood or, or trying to interfere or address the risk factor of preterm birth. About 80% we really don't know. And the factors that we know something about are really not universally, uh, universally applicable. Smoking sensation in this area, smoking cessation, progesterone therapy, those are not tools that will bring down preterm uh, prevalence incidence in, in um, other parts of the world, the Lesotho, the Kigalis, the Nairobis, all other areas where we hope to collaborate. But what we know, which is the good news, is that among those who are born preterm, we really do know quite a lot about how to bring down that, those deaths. About 75% of deaths due to preterm, we know what to do about. But there again is the exciting thing, and, and the sad thing, is that those solutions, those high impact solutions that we've known about for 30, 35 years, like kangaroo mother care, exclusive breastfeeding, mm -hmm. kangaroo mother care is probably less than 10% in every, whatever kind of analysis you do by country, by, by district, by, by local area. Kangaroo mother care is very low here in the San Francisco area. How many young girls who come in with a preterm baby are, are guided through that process through kangaroo mother care? So having a baby on skin to skin, keeping it warm and giving exclusive breastfeeding, that high impact intervention, we haven't moved the bar on that. 
So that's, some, that's a low hanging fruit, one might say, but of course, we need to do things differently to be able to change that. Secondly, there are, of course, other uh, aspects of this, um, uh, you know, exclusive breastfeeding. Yes, we have come up, but it's been flat too. So what I, what I think is the exciting thing is how can we move the bar on increasing intervention coverage for preterm babies while at the same time bringing in the discovery aspects and understanding more about it. For example, gestational age, which is, of course is a key thing to know if you want to bring antenatal corticosteroids to scale. Another low hanging fruit for us. So this is an exciting area. We look forward to that. We look forward both to the collaboratives that we, we want to draw on as well as that local collective action that could make a real difference at the local level. So thank you. Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, Mariam inspires us every day. Every <laughs> word that comes out of her mouth is gold. So um, I hope you got a little taste of that. Um, and please feel free to ask her questions. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, our esteemed colleague, uh, Zulfi Bhutta, who is currently the founding director um, of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health um, at Aga Khan, and that's just one of your hats. Um, he's also uh, running the intergrowth uh, work that's been happening the last five years. Thank you, Larry. Let me get the slide. So first of all, let me start by saying what an enormous privilege it is to be part of uh, this initiative. And let me congratulate you on, on putting this together in this wonderful symposium today. In 1982, I gave up the opportunity of training in San Francisco <laughs> in a neonatal <laughs> fellowship to return to my home country, Pakistan, as a pediatrician. And that was at a time that even though I trained in neonatal pediatrics, the discipline did not exist. The Planning Commission did not have a single position of a neonatal pediatrician in the country. How far have we come in the last 30 years or so? So I want to convey to you the sense of optimism and hope. Today, as we speak, even though we recognize there is a lot more that needs to be done for newborn survival worldwide, a lot has changed. And it's changed by the principle of collaboration, of joint work, the power of mutual conviction amongst like-minded people, individuals, across boundaries, across geographies, who took this upon themselves as a quest. That quest has now progressed to a more difficult part, where in 1982, when I went back, it was thought that care for babies under 1,200 grams was just not viable in hospitals because they never survived. This is what the situation was at my own university hospital at that time. And today, we are able to provide technology support not only in facilities, but in community settings. So let me start with the first sizzling slide because it is hot <laughs> off the press. It just came off the Lancet this morning, yep. which is the cause of death by for children under five. And that's what Larry was talking about. Joy Lons in the audience was one of the authors of this paper. Newborn deaths account for 44% of under five deaths and preterm deaths now account for the largest chunk, 15% of all the under five deaths worldwide. Mm -hmm. So we are rapidly moving as a global community from the relatively easier parts of diarrhea and pneumonia deaths, what we will have to tackle if we want to reduce child mortality. To do this, we need a blend of several types of sciences. We need the evidence, we need the science of information on interventions, but we also need a lot of knowledge on the science of delivery, how do we make this happen, and the principles underscored this morning of reaching those who are not being reached. So to tackle preterm births, we need a blend of interventions that can look at reducing the burden of the problem by prevention of preterm births per se. We need interventions that are post de facto when the births have actually taken place to address preterm survival by providing care to the baby. And importantly, we need to do something that relates to the births themselves by the treatment of and management of preterm labor. In all of these, 
tremendous progress has been made in understanding what works and where the gaps are. And there is a clear understanding also that what you require a life course approach, an approach that not only starts with the pregnancy itself, itself but interventions that would prepare you for an optimal pregnancy, things that relate to preconception care and care around the time of conception. And there is a list of interventions out there, but I'll just point out one. One of the most effective interventions to reduce the burden of problems that so many people in the world encounter relates to simple folic acid fortification and its optimal supply at a population level. And how long have we known this? We've known this for almost three decades. And yet, as we speak, less than 10% of the population in low and middle income countries has access to this simple intervention. You go beyond the preconception and periconceptual period to antenatal care, and here the list and repertoire of interventions increases. Again, we recognize that the big challenge around here is getting this at the right time to women who need it most. And in many places, the challenge is recognizing pregnancies early enough and getting women into the health system so that they can be provided both preventive and therapeutic care. Care during the process of labor, which is not different for preterm babies as for other newborn babies and relates to the appropriate quality of care within health systems. And also care after the baby is born, which has already been referred to. Things like exclusive breastfeeding, early initiation, thermoregulation, kangaroo care, infection prevention and management. But that's one continuum. And there is another continuum that I would like to underscore, that these interventions have to be placed and layered on the continuum of what we call health systems hierarchy. So you have interventions that are important that relate to intersectoral issues, educating girls, empowering them, poverty alleviation, social safety, <laughs> things that we do at community and household level, things that we do it out through outreach systems and at the upper levels of the health system. And in all of this, ladies and gentlemen, these interventions that we've recently underscored as part of the Every Newborn Action Plan have interventions that impact preterm births and could impact both survival as well as quality of outcome. We also took a leap of faith and we modeled what could we do with these interventions on preterm mortality, recognizing that mortality is just a starting point. And the important take-home lesson from this recent exercise was that we could reduce preterm mortality by close to 60%, something that people just did not fathom that this could be possible in the highest burden countries. And that a lot of these interventions related to things that can be done in the health system. So you see in this pie chart that about half of the reduction in preterm mortality would relate to improving care for preterm babies, including kangaroo mother care, not in sophisticated tertiary hospitals, but in district health systems, in low level facilities where currently simple hand washing is also not available at appropriate levels. And what difference could this make? We were also able to demonstrate that this could make a huge difference across the various geographies, but for one challenge. And that challenge, I want to underscore, is what Mariam said, is that many of these simple, life-saving, important interventions are not available to people who need this most. And that, as Larry underscored, is the agenda for us moving forward. How do we ensure that what we know today, that we can implement at scale, reach the populations that we reach most without stopping the progress of the discovery agenda to improve the quality, the nature, the depth, the fundamental understanding of existing and newer interventions as they develop. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope yeah. that we'll have an opportunity to answer questions. Good job. Thank you, Zulfi. So there is hope, and there is, and, and again, the hope lies in collaboration. And in the US, there is no better collaborator or more experienced uh, group than the March of Dimes, mm -hmm. who has been leading um, at the forefront of making a difference for a long time. Jennifer Howes is with us today, and she is the president of the March of Dimes. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello. 
I'm delighted to uh, be here with you today to um, share what I hope will be an upbeat and optimistic approach to the prevention of preterm birth that we've experienced so far uh, in, in the United States. Um, the title of this uh, uh, panel is Reversing the Trend Together. And you've heard, I think, some eloquent statements about collaboration, uh, and certainly it is a lot harder uh, than it seems. It's like collaboration. It's great. You go first, and I'll, I'll be sharing credit right behind you. Um, I'm going to emphasize, because this is the United States uh, 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 focus uh, that the March of Dimes uh, campaign has, I'm going to be emphasizing prevention, pre primary prevention of premature birth. Because we're quite good, really, uh, at saving lives of distressed newborns uh, here in this country. And so that means that if a prematurity prevention campaign is to be undertaken in the United States, it must be a campaign that focuses on prevention. Um, Dr. Harvey Feinberg, whom you heard from, he's very eloquent, and you heard from him this morning, he wrote this wonderful article in the New England Journal of Medicine about, you know, why don't we do prevention, primary, real prevention in this country? And I'm going to state this in a very, um, um, probably a low-class way because you're a very eloquent person. But basically, he said, because hospitals don't make as much, and doctors don't make as much money with prevention, uh, and because it's not sexy. He said, you know, we've got the ER, and it's very sexy. It's all over television. It's all over everything. But the PR, the prevention room, is not sexy. Now, you, you were very eloquent, uh, and my apologies, my friend, but, uh, but you made your points, and you made them well. I'm going to give you now, in the next four minutes, uh, a very, very quick tour through the March of Dimes uh, prevention campaign. And the first thing I want to say about the campaign is we undertook the campaign in 2003 because for 30 years the rates of preterm birth in our country had been rising and because our ranking, our global ranking, was terrible. We're like the worst of the industrialized countries. Uh, and an overall ranking that was done later, uh, a study done later, out of the 184 countries surveyed, we ranked 131st. So our numbers are not good. So it is with great humility, I think, that we uh, as, uh, as American citizens uh, really need to approach this problem of preterm uh, uh, prevention. So just to summarize very quickly, last 30 years, rates have been going up. Those rates peaked in the United States uh, at 12.8%, which is uh, about 530,000 preterm births out of an annual birth cohort in this country of 4 million. Baby, so a, a very uh, uh, a very large swath of of, uh, of, of prematurity. Uh, we undertook this campaign only in collaboration with leadership in obstetrics, pediatrics, in the nursing community, and with parent leaders who are willing to speak out because they were mission affected families, willing to speak out about their experiences. Um, from the uh, peak in the United States of 12.8 uh, to the most recent data we have. Um, which will be announced uh, in, 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 in just a few weeks, uh, we've had in the aggregate about a 12% drop in the rates of preterm birth. Uh, this is against a goal that was set uh, by the March of Dimes and its partners and collaborators of 9.6% or less by 2020. For those of you who love numbers, in the aggregate, what a seven-year drop, even though the drops are small in rates of preterm birth in our country, the aggregate is 231,000 fewer preterm births. And based on the um, uh, economic model established by the Institute of Medicine, in the aggregate, this is about a $1.9 billion savings. But it's in the PR, it's in the prevention room. And so it's not something that you hear. Those reporters that blew off Peter Hotetz when he wanted to talk about neglected diseases uh, do the same when it comes to discussions about prevention. So you might want to ask yourself, why, why has there been, even though it's incremental success, why has there been success? It's been basically because of uh, uh, the systematic uh, application and scaling up uh, across health systems, across consumer education, across professional practices of, of, of five uh, evidence-based uh, preventions. Number one, eliminating early elective deliveries before 39 weeks of completed gestation. This has been a standard of practice uh, put forward by ACOG since 1974. Uh, 
In fact, um, uh, when uh, this area was first looked at uh, by March of Dimes and its advisors, <coughs> what we found is that um, early elective inductions and deliveries performed before 39 weeks of completed gestation accounted for somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the excess preterm birth rates in our country. So a lot of people got together, put a lot of time, effort, and energy uh, on uh, creating quality improvement programs to really address these obstetrical practices in hospital. And the bottom line is that rates of mistimed early uh, elective uh, inductions and C-sections, those rates have gone down very, very, very dramatically in our country. Uh, that reduction has also been augmented by both policies and reimbursement procedures from public and private insurers, whereby hospitals and docs basically don't get paid if they do elective induction and C-section too early. This was also accompanied by a consumer education campaign, which, which explained, I think really for the first time, uh, to moms to be why those extra, why those last few weeks of pregnancy really count. We had a brain card. This was something that, that showed the size of the brain at 37 weeks, 38, 39, and uh, it was very, very compelling. So, so that's been quite successful. Progesterone therapy, yeah. if systematically yeah. applied to all women who've had a previous singleton premature birth, would eliminate uh, 10,000 preterm births in our country. We're at about probably um, 20 to 25 percent application of that. Reforming ART practices, the gold standard here would really be uh, single embryo transfer. This is not the case across the country and the risk of preterm birth uh, for, with twins and above with multiple births uh, is, um, is, uh, is doubled, the rate is doubled. 100% um, access to maternity care. This may not sound very exciting to you, but um, um, 11 million women of childbearing age in America uh, as of last year still did not have health insurance coverage, did not have maternity coverage. Half the pregnancies are, pregnancies are surprises. They might be wanted pregnancies, but they're surprise pregnancies. So if you're not insured and you don't even know you're getting pregnant, getting into care uh, for the detection of risk and the reduction of risk for the three horsemen of the apocalypse for preterm birth, which are hypertension, diabetes, and anemia, which cannot be detected if you are not in care, uh, uh, really uh, are going to be affected adversely in the absence of 100% access to maternity care for all women of childbearing age uh, in, in our country. So this is a very, very important element and one that I know all of you in this room in some way have been involved in trying to help connect uh, women without insurance or children without insurance uh, into uh, insurance uh, uh, coverage. In the last area, is the elimination of maternal smoking. We still have about 20 to 21 percent of women uh, who smoke during pregnancy. Uh, and so smoking cessation, while it might be an old program that we've all heard a lot about, is an essential component of eliminating that risk to having a premature baby. So how have we done since 2003? Well, you know, it's one thing to declare a campaign, but if you do not create mechanisms of accountability, uh, it will uh, not happen. So. In 2008, the March of Dimes and its partners, uh, we issued the first premature birth report card. This was not met with great enthusiasm by state health officials and governors and others, but it sure met with a lot of enthusiasm by health professionals and advocates. We were not doing well in the U.S. The report card is arrayed so that purple is the best score, because that's our March of Dimes color, and F <laughs> is F. It's, a, it's, it's red. So what you can see is roughly, uh, these are from 2007 data, um, a, third of, a third of the states in the U.S. were F, a third of the states uh, were Ds, um, and look at California, because I'm going to tell you a great story about <laughs> California. Uh, a handful of states were at C, and one state, is anybody here from Vermont? Okay, Vermont had the lowest rate of preterm birth in the United States of America at 9.0. Now I'm going to give you the fast forward because this is where the good news starts. Here we are. This is going to be released in three weeks. Three weeks. We, we, all together. So we are a nation that is not happy with being 131st out of 184 countries, right? Right. So this is, the, this is the current report card. So now uh, we have roughly a third of states who are at C, um, a third of states who are at, have gotten a B on the report card, 
and seven states, of which California, I think, is the tipping point, seven states have now achieved an A on the March of Dimes report card, which is a, a preterm birth rate of 9.6% or less. California is going to be at 8.8 because of fantastic leadership in this state. This is a laboratory for success. Couldn't be a better place for this preterm birth initiative. So we are very, very excited uh, about the progress and about the potential. Finally, last slide, where do we go from here? I predict in the United States we will reach this 9.6% uh, or, or less. We will reach this by next year or by 2016. Therefore, we need to set another target. In the US, we need to model ourselves in an aspirational way out for, with the best performing countries in the world. So we need to be probably roughly at about 5.5% or better in this country by 2030. So we match up with the uh, SDGs. We need to continue to sustain the interventions that work. We need to find new interventions and add them to this, to this toolkit, if you will, of interventions. We need to launch important and aggressive programs of discovery because we do not understand the mechanisms that cause women to go into labor too early and all of our panelists have, have commented on this uh, so we, we need to do that um, and finally I think that it is very very important uh, that we set our sights on success that we buckle down for sustainability and that we collaborate, 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 which isn't you go first, it's we go first and share the credit and make this country the best place for a baby to be born. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing, amazing work that's been done here. And I have to say that when you see those numbers, they give us hope. And then we also, you know, as uh, Mariam alluded to, we look at our San Francisco data, which is what we hope everyone aspires to, to really drive down the numbers. And we see the zip codes, we see the areas, and there's a 3.5% preterm birth rate among white women in San Francisco who have access to care or are insured and a 14.5% preterm birth rate among black women in a southeastern San Francisco zip code. Um, and that's unconscionable, but not when there's free care, doors that are open. So how we change that is yet another big issue. And, uh, and so let me uh, introduce our um, certainly not least, but last <laughs> uh, uh, leader in the field, Dr. Yes. Paul Wise, who is, um, uh, hails from our, uh, our collaborator at Stanford, um, where he is uh, Professor of Pediatrics, Health Policy, as well as Child Health and Society. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much, Larry. Well, if there were a Mount Rushmore of preterm birth, you would have the faces of these three people <laughs> carved into the mountainside. So it is indeed a privilege to share the stage uh, with you all and to be invited. Thank you, Jaime, so much, uh, and Larry, for this kind of invitation. I'm going to make a, a couple of really three observations. One, focus more on discovery. Two, on implementation. In terms of discovery, our best estimate is that approximately $400 million has been spent mm -hmm. on research into extreme prematurity in the United States over the last 20 years. $400 million. We still have very little insight into the primary etiology, much less the actual prevention of extreme prematurity. Now, there are some people who argue that we need more money and more time doing it sort of the way we've been doing it in the past to really have breakthroughs. My suggestion, and the colleagues that I work with at Stanford and across the country, part of the March of Dimes uh, new network for prematurity research, is that we need to do things in a different way. That the status quo is not acceptable, and that we have to create new kinds of research collaboratives that are capable of doing the research in far more innovative, more collaborative ways. How is that done? Easier said than done. It's not easy, particularly in American academic institutions. 
However, these kinds of collaborations, which should be called cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, what we're shooting for, as Larry pointed out, is transdisciplinary collaborations where researchers from diverse fields join together in a common investigative framework and vision and continue to do the work in that kind of collaborative architecture. It's very hard to do. It has to be purposefully designed, it has to be nurtured, it has to be facilitated. Even the language that is used in any kind of transdisciplinary research needs to be crafted and created and almost need translators in the room <laughs> when you get these very diverse fields together. The geneticists, they don't talk to the people who do microbiome research. They don't speak to the people who do placenta research. And nobody speaks to the people who do mental health research. You're going to have to be highly purposeful and focused on creating and nurturing and enforcing these kinds of collaborative structures. Second is that everybody recognizes and talks about the utility of networks getting together of all the different groups and research centers around the United States, around the country, in some type of coordinated fashion to address preterm birth. Nobody argues with the utility, the power of those kinds of networking capabilities. But what has to be remembered is that we have absolutely no infrastructure to network anybody or any of these centers focused on preterm birth now. We're going to have to create these collaborative infrastructures pretty much from scratch, modeling from other fields that have been very successful doing this, but we're gonna to have to create the infrastructure of these networks as we go along. It's not going to happen naturally using the traditional approaches to research that have characterized research into this area for the last 20 years. Now, in terms of operational activities, I couldn't agree more with the wisdom that's come out of the panel uh, so far. But I'm going to provide a slight caution that in my experience is critical. I'm a pediatrician. And the caution is that we tend to focus on the prevention of preterm birth by focusing on prenatal environment, prenatal care. We're focusing on delivering services once women conceive and then focusing during pregnancy. Even the names of our programs, Baby Your Baby, Beautiful Baby, Healthy Start, on and on and on, they're all about the babies. It's as if we only care about the health of the woman to the extent that it affects that of the newborn. We need to recognize We need to recognize that prenatal care, let's take a vote, who's against high quality prenatal care? Okay, <laughs> just double checking. We're all for high quality prenatal care delivered with dignity. But we need to reframe the prevention of <coughs> preterm birth, reframe how we think about preconceptual care and prenatal care as a component, although an important component, of women's health care over a lifetime. And it's going to be critical, particularly in global arenas, to recognize our colleagues and co-strugglers in women's health and how critical they will be to any discovery and certainly implementation of any strategies to prevent preterm birth. My last observation relates to the geography of our research and inter intervention uh, initiatives, that there's generally a tendency in global health to do research and to experiment with interventions in areas that have generally good governance, basically relatively good governance, relatively easy places to work, I say relatively. However, what we need to recognize is that the majority of under five deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa are not taking place in areas of relatively stable and good governance. They're taking place in areas that are post-conflict, and most post-conflict countries are functionally pre-conflict, again, churning conflict, poorly governed, very unstable politically. 
that the challenge to the preterm birth research community, the challenge to reducing preterm birth, is to in fact engage the tight linkage between health intervention and political legitimacy. To understand we're going to have to focus on creating health technologies, technical interventions that both respect and respond to poor governance in the areas of greatest need. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to build collaborations with political scientists, global security experts who work in the area of political legitimacy, work in the area of governance, so that we can craft research capabilities, intervention strategies that will actually be effective in the areas of greatest need, areas that are complicated to work, areas that are difficult to work, but there is no excuse anymore not to do it. It's understandable why the research and investments go to places that are relatively stable, but it's unacceptable to continue to do it that way. Now we have to be smart about these collaborations and smart about the way we do it, and it may be that building a research center in a relatively stable area can serve as a regional hub that extends the lessons learned, designs the research into regional areas that are very unstable in ways that are creative and smart and efficient. We need to recognize that health and political legitimacy are inextricably linked. I'm always reminded of an IF Stone image of a group of scientists recording the dance movements of a troop of dancers, but from behind a play class window. They can record with great fidelity every leap, every turn, every jump, but they never hear the music. Now, I'm confident with the leadership of the preterm birth initiative here, UCSF, leadership of the March of Dimes and the collaborating research centers around the country, that we will in fact begin to hear the fugue of interaction between the social drivers of poor child health, of preterm birth, of poor women's health, and our interventions. That we will hear the fugue of interaction that will best ensure that our policies, programs, and research will prove ultimately both effective and just. Thank you. Wow, um, thank you, uh, Paul. So we have, we have about 10, maybe we can squeeze 12 minutes before uh, lunch. <laughs> don't don't uh, knock each other over on the way to the mics. Um, but uh, let me plant some seeds uh, out there for uh, any comments. Um, we mentioned the life course approach, right? And so you can sort of see how wide and far the spectrum can reach. Uh, I don't know, you know if you knew the number um, up to between 40 to 50% of all preterm births could be prevented if there was access to family planning for those uh, moms. They are a result of unintended pregnancies. So when you think about ways that you can change this landscape, it actually involves all of you. It involves infection, it involves access, it involves empowerment, it involves health of the mother, health of the family, health of the system. So those will all make the difference. Um, so let's think about the balance between discovery, implementation, uh, what transdisciplinary really means, and innovation. Um, Joe, is that Joe who's first? Joe Spidell. Yeah, Joe Spidell, UCSF uh, Bixby Center. I'm glad you mentioned family planning because that's what I came up to, to also talk about. And I think that uh, Family planning allows a very safe pattern of childbearing with adequate birth spacing and helps eliminate teen pregnancies. And I think one of the reasons we've seen a good decline in uh, preterm uh, births is the fact that pre uh, teen pregnancies have dropped by about half over the last decade or so. Yeah, thank you. I know we need the data 
um, to prove what uh, our successes have been in California. In fact, that's our next effort, is to understand that 8.8%, what, what worked? What quantitative and qualitative information can we gather that will tell us where to keep focusing and maybe where to course correct? Any other comments about family planning? That's good. Okay. So, I mean, I certainly underscore that. And, uh, and you know, in low and middle income countries, particularly in the geography that I come from, the single largest intervention, as I mentioned, that will impact me is increasing the age at marriage, is ensuring that girls have access to education and that they stay in that system, and that will in turn have an impact on all the other cascade of events that take place, not only in terms of her reproductive performance, but what happens and transmits across generations. You know, I have to tell you, Zulfi, you just made me think of, I, I see Craig Cohen somewhere in the audience. And when we had our first uh, uh, faculty meeting just to brainstorm about ideas, Craig raised his hand and said, I think one of the first things we have to talk about is uh, child marriage um, uh, practices. And of course, the bench scientists in the room who are part of this transdisciplinary, you know, sort of eyes rolling, glazed, you know, where, where's the bathroom? But the problem is, how do we get people who really either do not work together or have nothing to do with each other in terms of what they do for their work and what drives their passion, and while sitting together at the same table, generate that innovative new idea that's going to bring together the disciplines that are not connected. That's, that's what drives innovation, and it is challenging. Um, that's it. Hello, my name is Crystal Steed, and I'm a second year medical student from Toro University. Um, I'm kind of in going with the direction that you're leading this conversation as in with family planning and educating women. Um, I thought about this for a couple years just with personal interest. And I feel like while our country is in a state of um, empowering women and educating women, and I think it's so important, I feel like a lot of these um, developing countries are still in a state of educating men and teaching men about um, health and the importance of um, women and um, I guess what you know family planning is and a lot of them are also not open to Western um, advice or direction and I guess in a sense of I don't know really what is being done in a sense of educating young men and you know leaders in their countries that are it is, they are patriarchal countries. Great question. And you know, how are we taking those steps and not kind of leaving them out of the picture and jumping to the women, where you know they're not ready to allow that yet? Absolutely. Do you want do you want to mention anything about the? Yeah, just to say, I, I think we could look at um, you know preterm deaths, newborn mortality as a wedge that's part of a continuum reproductive, maternal, newborn, child health. It's just one way, it's one of the traces that somehow tells us that something is wrong in that continuum mm -hmm. between reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health. And that's the way, if we approach it that way, in a, in a, in a new way, and you also alluded to that, Sophie, that this is not, this is about, you know, every newborn action, but it's also part that, that being part of a broader uh, maternal, newborn, and you so well put it better than me. It's about the woman, and children, it's what women and children, and if we can look at it, the broader women and children agenda, the centrality of sustainable development, maternal mothers and newborns within that context, then then we'll make a difference. And I think that's what we all hope here, that's how, that's how we're going to make a difference together in the United States, because I don't think it's about the Western world, uh, you know, teaching or having really that much to inform the rest of the world about, but really a dialogue around these issues and see how one can solve those things in different cultural contexts. And I would also direct everyone to take a look at the science supplement issue. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see Melinda Gates wrote a beautifully eloquent editorial on applying the gender lens for exactly the issue you described to all of the mm -hmm. uh, grantees um, in the foundation and uh, both currently and going forward. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Hi, um, I'm Shinny Silberberg. I'm a graduate student here at UCSF. And my question pertains to um, the collaboration aspects. People have been mentioning a lot about inter interdisciplinary collaboration. And I was wondering, what is being done to promote um, institutions like UCSF that have medical students and have global health and have researchers to form collaborations between the students already at a young stage in their training? Um, I know some of these programs exist, but what is being done to promote them and creating more of these programs? Absolutely. Well, I, I, I will say, in this initiative, something we're all excited about, and especially at UCSF, but it will apply globally to all of our partners, is this um, program called New Minds, New Ideas, which was actually something that Mark Benioff pushed um, specifically, and is a direct application of what's worked to make him successful with Salesforce. And uh, it's very much about the fact that some of the best ideas come from people come from, first of all, young people, but especially people who are sometimes on the fringes of this area of expertise or in unrelated disciplines, on the edges of a campus or in a partner country without a mentor, um, you know, who are not jaded yet and who, uh, you know, are, are maybe applying lessons that they've learned um, that all of us maybe are forgetting. And so this New Minds, New Ideas really actually makes an effort to seek out the young investigators and mentor them, give them an infrastructure, create this second generation, new generation of preterm birth investigators. But a new investigator or a young investigator is not just an academic investigator that you might typically think, but is just as much a community-based participatory research program or a community leader or an adolescent in an affected community who can have a voice and access to information that we'd never have otherwise. So it's an excellent question and very much a part of what's going to be different. So let me say, um, all of you made such salient, incredible points that um, are what this initiative is all about. I think to, to leave you, uh, I have to say a word about the transdisciplinary because um, we say it, and we say that word transdisciplinary, and we say the word multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and I've recently <coughs> seen a uh, set of three pictures, slides, that Nancy Adler here at UCSF shared with me that really gelled it for me. And it's a sandbox, just a sandbox, right, that a couple of kids are playing in, little kids. And the multidisciplinary picture has a sandbox with Four kids, they all have their backs to each other. They're all playing with their pail and you know, shovel and creating something. And because they're in the same sandbox using the same materials, it's multidisciplinary. But it's not much interaction or not the kind you'd think. Interdisciplinary, the four kids are now all facing each other and they're all playing in little piles in front of them, doing their own thing. But you don't kind of see a unifying theme, but they're all in the same sandbox and they're all trying. And transdisciplinary, you're in that sandbox, and the four kids are surrounding a sandcastle, one sandcastle, and it's elaborate. And you see one working on the turret, and one on the moat, and one on, you know, some other detail. And that what, come, what emerges from that collaboration is very different than any one of them could have brought into the picture. So that, that's the essence of transdisciplinary, to, to take someone from, you know, an astronaut from NASA and a chef, and two people you'd never think would have anything to tell you about preterm birth, and suddenly you're talking about dehydrated food and nutrition and access to solve anemia in endemic areas. It's that kind of out-of-the-box thinking that will actually turn the curve and help us all work together because it's what we're all looking for. So our, our kind of key words have become innovation, empathy, and optimism. And those three words were uh, directly from Melinda Gates and very inspiring to all of us doing this work. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you.